All right, everybody, we're about to get started, so if I can have you take a seat, that would be much appreciated. I don't think anybody heard me back there. <laughs> Got to go really close. There we go. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Just a quick mic check. Can everyone hear me all right? Great. All right. Well, thanks for taking the time and coming down this evening. Um, tonight, you're going to hear a presentation from our Coconino County Flood Control District, as well as City of Flagstaff staff, uh, to let you know about long-term mitigations in, in the works. Uh, after that, we'll take some general questions. And then we've also got our engineering experts here to take any specific questions you may have at the end of the meeting. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn over to Mayor Deasy. Um, Thank you everyone for being here. I know this has been a terribly trying summer and that we are here to find solutions. Uh, I am very glad that we were able to get these detention basins in just three months time set up, but this is only a piece of the puzzle. And our engineers are working so diligently in collaboration with uh, Flood Control District. We have been pushing for federal dollars, speaking with our federal delegation, working with ADOT to uh, address the 180 jurisdiction. And um, still, a lot of work done and a lot of work that I know needs to get done quickly. So I'm glad we are here to get the full information of what's going on, what the conceptual plans are moving forward, and to get your input, especially as we are down to now two designs from six uh, for how we're going to get this across 180 to the Rio de Flag. Um, with that, though, I know there's a lot of questions. There's a lots and lots of very legitimate concerns, and I'm hoping that through this process, what it's gonna take is us all coming together to find solutions through a very, very troubling situation. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over is, uh, to Patrice Horstman, the chair of the County Board of Supervisors and chair of our flood control district um, that we are working daily with our staff to do everything we can to uh, mitigate the flooding that nobody should have to be facing. Uh, yet these are unprecedented times. Yes, I, and my name is Patrice Horseman. As, as the mayor indicated, I am the, the uh, chair and also the uh, supervisor for District 1. Uh, and it is, I'm sorry we have to be here, but I'm glad you all are here because I think there'll be some very good information. We want to hear from you. We want to get your comments. And we also want to be able to try to answer your questions as the mayor said, it has been one heck of a summer. Uh, and we are doing what we can in hopes that we can help to mitigate that and help do what we can to prepare for this next year. And you're going to hear from the city and county staff who have been working very, very diligently. And as the mayor said, we really have been working hand in glove, city and the county have not only been working together and coordinating their efforts for emergency response, and you have noticed on the west side here in the city of Flagstaff, it's primarily been the purview of the city of Flagstaff for their stormwater and their drainage, and the county has been working primarily on the east side with the eastern communities that have certainly been devastated uh, from this flooding. There have been over 40 separate flooding events. And as you can imagine, this has, this is the biggest natural disaster that the city and the county have ever experienced. However, I think you've also seen the city and the county working together have really joined their efforts to do what we can to assist in this very devastating time. And there's more that needs to be done uh, you're going to hear tonight from some of the experts who have been working and looking at potential mitigation efforts. And you're also going to hear that these mitigation efforts far exceed the ability of the city and the county, even together, to be able to manage all the expenses for these mitigation efforts. 
So what you're also going to hear is what we've been doing is working very dil diligently. The mayor, the vice mayor, the vice chair, myself, and quite frankly, every member of the Board of Supervisors and every member of the City Council to work with Senator Kelly, Senator Sinema, and Tom O'Halloran to get the federal monies we need to do the mitigation job we need to get done for our communities. And you need to know that because of their efforts, the city got the EWPP, that emergency funding, for that uh, sediment basin. And I'm going to tell you, four months to do that sediment basin, that is unprecedented. That is a record. But it got done because of the coordination with the county. It got done because of the commitment that the city made to all of you to try to get that done. We are also looking forward to get some emergency funding through Congress. Both our senators and our representative, O'Halloran, signed a letter asking to include in the congressional budget emergency supplemental specifically for Coconino County and the city of Flagstaff. But guess what? We're in an election year. And so they have not taken action on this, and they told us they won't take action on it until after the election. In many ways, this, will, this coming election is extremely important for all of us. We certainly are going to do what we can, and we are going to advocate for as much federal funding as we can to accomplish the mitigation efforts that we feel we would like to and need to get done for our communities. So you're going to hear a lot today. You're also going to hear about another matter that is extremely important and that is forest restoration. I was talking uh, to a resident here as I was coming in, and that is that if we do not do the necessary forest restoration, especially on the upper Rio, the west side of the peaks, then we are going to continue to fight these drought-ravaged forests and the forest, the forest fires in the spring and then these devastating monsoon floods. So we need to get forest restoration done. It is one of the reasons that the flood control district, quite frankly, increased the flood control tax. So we would have monies available to do the matches we need for federal forest restoration funding available through the IIJA. With that, with the commitment of all of you, with the commitment of the city, with the commitment of Coconino County, we want to prioritize the Upper Rio, and we are working very strongly with the Forest Service for them to prioritize the Upper Rio. So thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to the experts who really have important information to share. Thank you again. All right, thank you, Mayor and, and Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Lucinda Andriani. I serve as the Flood Control District Administrator as well as Deputy County Manager. And, uh, you know, we're here tonight. It's been shared. Uh, this has been a really horrific summer uh, for a lot of people in this broader community. Nine watersheds impacted, and um, the level of increase in flooding for example, in this corridor, and you're going to hear this several times tonight, the flood flows are 26 times pre-fire flows. So as one can well imagine, there is no infrastructure out there that was designed or could manage that. Nowhere, frankly, anywhere in this country. Um, and so, um, you know, we have a Herculean effort ahead of us, and that effort uh, requires, I mean, it is fundamental and in, in, in essential that we get this federal and state funding to fund this, that as, as was mentioned. These, this level of resources is you're going to see the, the, the overall cost that's needed um, is over $100 million. And uh, uh, this is something that's never faced the city or the, or the district or the county in history. So... So I have some information tonight to share with you. I think it's important that a little bit of history, because I think part of understanding where we need to go is where have we been and what is, what is the history. And um, some of you may or may not be aware of what the 
flood control district has dealt with since back in 2010 when we had the Schultz fire and subsequent f flooding. That affected uh, seven watersheds at that time. Uh, there were two new watersheds affected by the pipeline fire uh, this past spring. And uh, we were successful at that time at mitigating the flooding within five of those uh, flood corridors. Uh, two elected decline mitigation that did not move forward. Um, but um, unfortunately, with the, what you'll see is the level of increased flood flows, uh, a lot of that mitigation is being overwhelmed. Is it helping and having a positive impact? Absolutely. Uh, but is it being overwhelmed? Absolutely. Um, and then moving on from that, we had the slide fire in Oak Creek Canyon in 2014. Uh, we were fortunate there. We did a, a lot of work on short-term mitigation, uh, but we're pretty successful. Uh, weather events helped us avoid any really catastrophic flood events there. Then out in the North Schultz flood area in 2018, we had a thousand year rainfall event, which created quite a bit of impact in that area again. The mitigation that had been constructed there during Schultz did reduce down those impacts significantly, but there was still an impact. Again, going back to the point that whatever level of design you put into place, you will not be able to mitigate every level of rainfall event. That just isn't possible. And then, of course, everyone in, in the city is very familiar with what happened with the museum fire back in 2019. Um, the, the district has carried the lion's share of that work and cost relative to that. Uh, we've spent at least six million to date uh, relative to that whole effort, both on the immediate mitigation, uh, which the district stepped in and implemented immediately in 2019. We were already in the monsoon season when that fire took place. And, and then since then, uh, major investments in um, long-term mitigation, both on and off forest. And then of course now the, the pipeline fire, and it says approaching seven million, I failed to uh, update that. We're now, just from this monsoon season, the district spent 8.2 million on response and short-term mitigation. So we're upwards of about 90 million that's been spent in the last 12 years on post-wildfire flooding uh, within our communities. Um, they, again, another key element of the past is the integrated strategy that we used within Schultz and that we, would, we applied to museum as being applied to museum and, of course, would be applied here as well. And, but again, uh, that mitigation is also being impacted because the flood flows now are so much greater than they were um, post-Schultz. So what did we see this last summer? I want to share, some of you may not be aware of the level of flooding that took place on the, out in the Timberline, Mupaki Trails area um, and how uh, significant this was and that we have absolutely seen the unraveling of pretty much all eight of those watersheds have completely unraveled. And uh, as a result of that, um, we're seeing just Tremendous flows. Let's make sure now. Let's see if we've got what. Let's see if I can start this. So this is the Copeland flood corridor. You can see there are boulders, trees, stumps coming down. Those boulders are upwards of eight feet across. And there are water that's that that watershed has completely unraveled. So above this watershed and, and all the watersheds to the, in this, these areas, uh, there are areas where the water historically and naturally spread out and slowed down. We call those alluvial fans. And um, those fans now that were providing some level of natural mitigation to the flooding uh, again, they've all unraveled. They're now heavily in size. The channels out there are anywhere from 10 to probably 20, 25 feet deep now. Um, 
And what, mean, what that means is that they become more efficient over time. They're actually delivering water and sediment much more rapidly and efficiently. This is what that property, that, that video was taken from the porch of that Victorian home there. And um, this is what it looked like afterward, was the level of uh, rock that was brought down. And that was that debris flow extended almost all the way down, uh, not too far actually from the highway. So if you just step across the roadway from that boulder field, this is then the eroded channel that was created in that area. And this is before uh, the flooding that was experienced. And actually, I think even in August, it was probably part early August, this photograph was taken. This is the Wapaki Trails area. It's the furthest north watershed that's been impacted. Actually, there's one more watershed further. This is the furthest north that's affected homes and, and private property. Um, the further north is, is affecting um, the highway very dramatically. Um, this is Wupaki Trails. This is um, where the water outlets that neighborhood in one of the locations. It outlets in a couple locations. And the home that you're going to see in this video has been uninhabitable. <laughs> And again, that home has been uninhabitable since, since June, and uh, that family is, is trying to figure out a way to be able to move back into that home. This is a photograph after flooding. Of, you can see the tremendous amount of sediment and impact. You can see the flood. The flooding did go within this home. Um, it was flooded about two to three feet um, on a couple of several occasions, even with the barrier. Uh, this is Seacrest School. This is your neighborhood. Um, this is the, shows some you know, uh, experience there with the flooding and how that impacted the highway the school and the course down the street. And then there's some photographs here of, of Seacrest and the flooding and the debris and sediment. Uh, as well as then the backwater effect here. Uh, you get, we get ponding in a number of areas. This happens not only within the city in the Savannah Way area, but also out in Doney Park. There's a lot of, you get to flatter areas, a lot of ponding. And I will say too, that uh, to some extent, the mitigation employed by people contributed this to some extent as well. So that's why we're constantly saying, only put sandbags at your home. Uh, do not mitigate your properties. Um, and that's why we've stuck with that tenant uh, during Schultz and since then. So, so what has been uh, a lot, some of these, these facts have been shared with you before, but we actually had 45 major flood events this year, 155 uh, National uh, Weather Service flash flood warnings just for these corridors as well as uh, 45 RAVE notifications. RAVE is the county's emergency notification system. And that shares some information about that's property valuation, not damage, but property valuation. And that's probably a underestimate. Um, on the east side, there's actually 1,729 homes that are at risk of flooding uh, within the city. I, I know it's, it's certainly probably at least 500. So um, as, as I think you may have seen uh, during the prior meeting and then also um, uh, online, the, um, the district, frankly, the day the fire started, my first phone call is always to, where's Joe? Where's Joe? <laughs> There's Joe. Joe Loveridge with Jay Fuller Hydrology and Geo Geomorphology. That's the first call I make as soon as there's a fire anywhere. And, um, you know, we start talking about preparing the modeling to be able to model, uh, begin to model whatever impacts there are on the watershed. So he's looking at information. There's flights typically done at night uh, by the Forest Service that looks at the level of burn severity. And he's integrating that data into the, into the modeling uh, so that we can begin to develop 
um, an, an understanding of what will be the flood hazard impacts and the, and the flooding impacts <clears throat> and level of flood flows within uh, the watersheds that are impacted. And uh, as we, once we secure the final burn severity map from the bear, burned area emergency response team, of which Joe was a member of that team, um, then he integrates that in, and this is, this is what the results show, which is, again, the increase in flood flows in these corridors is anywhere from 27 times to 26 times. And you can see on the left-hand side here is the, um, the actual discharge, the cubic feet per second of water flow. And you can see, for example, for government tank, this is, this is at the forest boundary at the neighborhood. It's over 4,000 cubic feet per second. The far right bar there, that red bar, is Schultz Creek. You can see that's in the range of, I think, about 750 or so uh, cubic feet per second. Uh, but again, you can see that the pre-fire flows were very, very low in that, in that corridor. And therefore, that's what creates that 26 times uh, increase in the flood flow. But you can see even in those that were affected by Schultz and the tunnel, those orange bars and the blue bars are, are um, one is the 2016 is the post uh, Schultz modeling that was done by Fuller um, after all the mitigation was, was uh, constructed out in the Schultz flood area. And you can just see that the level of increase that's taken, taken place. So, uh, this is this is the challenge. Uh, unfortunately, during this last summer, fortunately or unfortunately, um, the worst is probably yet to come, because we the gr largest individual rainfall event that we saw was about a 10-year rainfall event, and that was in the government tank uh, watershed. And so we have not seen that design storm, or I, should, I shouldn't refer to it as a design storm, but that rainfall event that we used for that modeling, the two inch in uh, 45 minutes, that uh, storm did not occur this summer. And that's a 25 year rainfall event. And what we have seen is mostly anywhere from one up to five year, maybe Again, uh, one, one event that was 10 years. So we've seen, we saw a lot of rainfall events. We had a lot of rainfall this monsoon, but we didn't see very intense events, unlike the summer prior, where we saw several very large uh, events, 200 to 300 year. I think we had two of those, two or three of those, uh, both within the city and, and adjacent areas. So, um, so if you want to, this is what keeps me up at night, is we still really haven't seen a, a really major rainfall event, intense rainfall event in any of these corridors or watersheds. Because it, it's what happens on the mountain that matters. It's those steep slopes, it's the rainfall hitting those steep, severely burned slopes that creates catastrophic flooding. So what was the response? Uh, the district moved very quickly and um, we set a goal of, of producing a million sandbags. We reached that goal about mid-August, <laughs> mid to late August, um, and uh, did that through a number of means, but created those sandbags. Those are the sandbags and sandbags prior that were created for uh, prep for the museum um, flood area were also created, vast majority produced and provided by the district. Um, we also placed about four miles of concrete barrier, uh, both within and outside of the city. And um, the district hired a set of engineers, engineering firms, that then went out and developed mitigation exhibits for properties both within the city and outside of the city and I think all total, we had at least 1,000 exhibits that were generated through that process, probably more uh, upwards of probably about 1,200, I would expect, or, or more that were generated. We had mitigation that had been constructed during Schultz that was damaged primarily by the tunnel fire, some, uh, some level of damage by the pipeline fire. All of that had to be repaired 
as well as then preparing all the channels and everything for, for flooding. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the district spent on response costs and the short-term mitigation, 8.2 million to date. I think we were just about getting close to having received all the invoices. And um, of that 8.2 million, 3.5 million was expended producing sandbags and placing barrier, of which the vast majority of that was sandbags. We did receive an NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, emergency watershed protection exigency funding um, of two million. Uh, this is the same type of funding the city got to construct the detention facility at the city property at the Y. Um, and again, just, just to note that, um, yes, we had a lot of nor greater than normal rainfall, but not greater than normal intense events. Uh, they were fairly uh, small level of events. I want to add to that, um, you know, it, I, what, you know, what the chair said relative to the city mobilizing very quickly and getting the, the detention facility designed and construction constructed, that's, that's really a major effort. And I sure wish the county and or district had land that could have been used for a similar type effort, but unfortunately we do not. So, uh, but good, it was really great that they mobilized that very quickly. That's gonna be very instrumental in uh, long-term mitigation for, for the Schultz Creek Corridor. So I wanna take a few minutes and talk about, uh, we immediately also, of course, began to work with our congressional delegation that it was mentioned. And obviously the first question is, well, what's the plan and how much money do you need? And so I very quickly put together, again, similar set of, of, of engineering firms to help develop that, what that plan might look like. Um, the district focusing on the eight watersheds to the, to the east, as well as all the on-force measures, both in Schultz Creek and the other eight watersheds. And the city really began to focus on, you know, within the city, that's, of course, one of the immediate steps was the detention facility and we developed that you know again using this integrated strategy much like we did during Schultz integrating on forest watershed restoration watershed restoration not forest restoration but watershed restoration measures with mitigation measures flood more traditional flood mitigation through through the neighborhoods and then in addition, because both Highway 180 and, and Highway 89 are being significantly impacted, integrating into that improvements that are needed with the drainage systems there that both have to integrate, uh, that, are, that would be implemented to both protect the highways as well as to integrate with what's proposed for neighborhood mitigation as well. So I wanna take a few minutes and just walk through the highlights of this because again, I think it's really important that you understand what's going on, you know, in the entire nine watersheds, the other eight watersheds as well. Um, this is, a, and I know this is hard to see, but there'll be a map in the back. Um, this is uh, what's proposed on forest. So we work very closely with the Forest Service. We were extremely successful working with the Forest Service post Schultz, as well as more recently uh, with Museum in developing watershed restoration projects. And um, Alan Hayden with Natural Channel Design is here, and he's gonna come up next and, and um, share with you more detail about what do these on-forest measures look like and why do we then employ them? Really, the number one goal is we're trying to get the level of sediment and debris down because anything you construct downstream, if you don't reduce the sediment, then it will have no capacity to respond you know, to, the, to the flood water, right? It'll just fill up with sediment. Any storm drain you put in, any channel, any crossing, it'll just fill up with sediment. So the game changer is what we can get done on forest. And we've made a request to the US Forest Service uh, for $40 million to fund all of the on forest work in all nine watersheds. So that includes expanding some of the existing on-force mitigation work, restoration work that we did during Schultz, as well as 
uh, four new corridors. So this is the list of the proposed work areas. Um, these are the corridors. Uh, largely, these are the corridors. A couple are some, some berm work and so forth that's also proposed. And you can see that Schultz Creek here is probably going to come in. These are, these are estimates based on conceptual level engineering right now. Uh, probably going to come in anywhere between three and a half and four million. Then as we move downstream, of course, then when that water comes off the forest, uh, it's actually as the water comes off of the alluvial fans, it's captured in what we call terminal trenches. And then it goes through a transition channel into the neighborhood. And that's really critical because what's happening right now on those watersheds, all these watersheds, is that the flood paths are changing. They're changing pretty much every rainfall event. And so having predictability, obviously if you go in and you put in what might be a four or eight million dollar channel and then the flow moves a half a mile to the west or north or east, then it, that channel is no longer functional. So you have to have a system coming off the forest that collects up that water um, that's had a significant reduction in the level of sediment, collects up that water, and then directs that water into the flood mitigation going through the neighborhoods. And um, we're estimating with the various work that needs to go into those corridors on the east side, the eight corridors, that we're looking at upwards of 50 to $55 million. And this is similar to what we would probably see out there. Uh, during post Schultz, the level of flooding was such that we were able to go more with a natural channel system. Um, unfortunately, the level of velocity and volume of water now uh, is obviously exceeding that capacity and um, uh, we're proposing to move to all concrete channels to be able to address that level of uh, flooding. Then with the highway drainage improvements, this doesn't include 180. This is the 89 corridor, but 180 is in, this pro is in this same kind of process that we're going through working both with federal highways as well as with ADOT. And um, we have an ADOT representative, Brian Foley, our district engineer here is tonight. We've been working very closely with them uh, to both identify uh, projects and what needs to occur as well as potential funding for, for those as well, those projects as well. So in summary, um, the total of the entire investment, we're looking at, again, upwards of 130 to $145 million. So uh, with a, a direct, even if we were to secure the typical, you know, potential federal funds uh, for these projects, um, the district would still be looking at probably somewhere 50, 40 to $50 million direct expense, and let alone all the cash flow that you're managing, managing that level of projects. So what are the next steps? Key to all this is, again, securing the federal funding and, and state funding. And so we had a meeting in August uh, with our co-hosted with uh, Congressman O'Halloran. We had the Chief Deputy of the Forest Service here. We had the um, Deputy Undersecretary uh, that oversees the NRCS uh, with, within USDA, and we had a Federal Highways official here as well. And we went through this plan with them and clearly articulated what the need is. And as was shared, um, our, Congress, our congressional delegation has been extremely supportive, and they're working with their colleagues, they're communicating with their colleagues and positioning us to take advantage of any emergency supplemental that may come forward. But right now, the earliest that would happen is probably early to mid-December, probably more likely mid-December. And if it doesn't occur then, then we're into the, the appropriations process next year. So there's no guarantee as to when or if or how much funding we'll be able to secure. And that's critical to being able to move ahead with, with any level of these projects. So 
Uh, with that, I'm going to ask Christopher Tressler who's going to come up and share just one of the projects that I know is of interest in, in this area is the Eldon Lookout Road Crossing Project, and um, he's going to spend a few minutes talking about that specific project, uh, and then we'll, we'll go on to the next, uh, the, the next piece. So thank you, Christopher. Thanks, Lucinda. So uh, we are, this is turning into a public works project with the uh, construction of the base and upstream of Mount Eldon Lookout Road. It, uh, it's going to do some really good things for, to help us arrest sediment, to put the sediment in a place where we can clean it out and help respond. But what it also does is it extends the, the time that the Mount Eldon Lookout Road may be flooded. And so we need to elevate the road a little bit and put in a box culvert. Uh, right now that road, once, once the flood passes, which usually takes about an hour, we scrape it off and get it back open again. If we don't do this project, the, the road could potentially stay flooded for hours and hours. And so we're uh, in the, working with an uh, engineering contractor to design the project this winter, and we're expecting to go to construction in the spring. It uh, will likely include a couple box culverts. The public works, is, uh, is we're funded by transportation dollars that can be used to fund transportation-related infrastructure projects. So this is really a much-needed upgrade. We have the the savings in a sense from, uh, unfortunately, salary savings from COVID and, and different things. Uh, and so we have money in the bank that we can use uh, to fund this project. And so it uh, likely will not impact the flood control district. Uh, and we likely will not be asking for the city of Flagstaff to support this project. And it'll largely be, uh, if not wholly, a, uh, a transportation related project that the county uh, public works will fund. All right, thank you, Christopher. So up next, Alan Hayden, who's the president with Natural Channel Design, is going to come up and talk about the on-forest measures. And I just want to reiterate that this is the critical piece. We've got to be able to get onto the forest and get these measures um, constructed because, again, nothing downstream will work <laughs> unless Alan and his team do their magic on forest. And these, this is really an effort to transition those watersheds um, forward by decades. And um, a little bit of background, a little bit of history. During the whole Schultz effort, and Christopher Tressler was a part of that team, during the whole Schultz effort, uh, Natural Channel Design went out and walked all the various channels around the peaks that had been impacted by fires. Some were 75-year-old fires, some were 50-year-old, some were 40, some were 10-year-old fires. And they looked at how had those channels changed over time. What's the natural progression that channels go through to go back to a more normal state, pre-fire state? And basically, the engineering and development of this this approach uh, came out of that work, and it's been tremendously successful. So in the Schultz area, after we constructed these measures, other than the 1,000-year rainfall event in the Brandis Corridor, we had zero flooding downstream. So it was extremely successful um, what was done there. Now, every watershed's different. Everyone has a little bit different configuration and, and design features and so forth. But these measures are, again, are really, this was the game changer and will remain the game changer. So with that, I will turn it over. So we're advancing these watersheds basically probably by about 75 years is the goal. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, so a little bit about the, the watershed as um, that exists up there right now. You know, fortunately, uh, the Schultz Creek watershed hasn't experienced super high flows like, flow, like we've seen out on the east side. And so the watershed hasn't completely unzipped. We're, we're watching it start to crack and unravel. And we can see that at the Schultz Pass Road, um, where it's ex 
taken out the road and it's exposed the city's pipeline. Uh, we've seen head cuts advancing up towards the gas line, up towards Orion Springs. And as you walk along the trail, um, up Schultz Creek Trail, and looking at, you're paying close attention to the, to the creek itself, you can see that even the smaller flows that we've had so far have started to move the largest rocks. And those large rocks kind of hold the whole channel in place. And there are, is an awful lot of sediment underneath those large rocks that is just waiting to come downhill. So we're in a good position, um, if you will, that we can actually kind of get ahead of this, we think. Oh, does that help if I stand a little closer? I was kind of, I got to stand back so I can read the slide too. I'm getting old. <laughs> So anyway, we're in a good position, if we can get onto this, um, that we can kind of head off a lot of this sediment and get ahead of the problem, uh, much like we did for museum fire. There's a lot of forethought that went into that, and we were luck fortunate enough to get to it before the big floods got. And while we did have big floods and lots of sediment, the places that we were able to do work in the beginning helped quite a lot. So that's... Um, that's where we sit in the watershed right now. Um, and the goal of this on forest watershed restoration is a reduction of sediment and to get rid of the source and to slow down the transport of that sediment. So that as Lucinda said, once the water gets down into the populated areas, we don't have to deal with the huge bulk loads of sediment in our channels as well. And that becomes a huge issue. We have to clean it out storm after storm and clean out the streets storm after storm. And that becomes a huge mess. And it, and it makes those, all of the concrete and channels and pipes that we can put through town super inefficient because they're getting clogged every time. Um, so the goal is this watershed restoration, is of watershed restoration is to reduce the sediment. Now, in many cases, uh, this is an example from the museum fire that includes the restoration of an alluvial fan. Uh, this is uh, the west trib of Spruce Avenue Wash. On the left is what it looked like following the fire and following the initial flooding. It cut a ditch through that fan about six to eight feet deep. Uh, and that ditch is super efficient at transporting both water and sediment. It gets to town faster. And, but that ditch sits inside an alluvial fan, which is a natural formation formed over many eons of high sediment loads after old fires or after glaciers and things like that, where sediment exceeds the amount of water that can come down. It spreads that sediment out in a low slope area, and it continues to build sediment over eons. And so we rebuild that surface, and that's what that looks like up there today. We rebuild that surface, we spread those flows out, get rid of the depth, reduce the velocity, and the sediment starts to drop out on top. And really importantly, it doesn't pick up and transfer more sediment down to town. And you do that wherever you can find um, the appropriate valley type and valley width and area and lowest slope that you can build alluvial fans. And then in other areas where you're stuck with using a, a channel, uh, the single thread channel to transport flows, you can construct that so that it doesn't degrade by building grade control into that channel. So, so a little bit about what's going on in Schultz Creek. Uh, we have put together some conceptual plans and we are working with the Forest Service to um, d get these plans, the conceptual level plans through the NEPA process so that when money is available and we have the time, we can actually get to work as quickly as possible. We have the permits in place. Um, the, these, the plan looks at looking at, uh, con at protecting the roadway, which has the city pipeline underneath it. It looks at utilizing uh, the, the alluvial fan that's left, which is right above the city basins, and making sure that that is working as efficiently as possible. Uh, and it also, mainly, because we haven't totally torn apart the Schultz Creek watershed yet, is make sure that there's plenty of grade control 
in that channel so that it is there in place when we do get those big flows, it doesn't downcut and it doesn't create that ditch, okay? Um, so there's coming in potentially two phases because it's fairly complicated NEPA process for the Forest Service. And they're trying to work with us as fast as they can to get this done. Um, and we're probably looking at areas in the lower fan and then up where the road crosses um, as being able to do that maybe as early as this spring, as having the permits in places, if we have that. And then moving on towards a fall and winter construction zone next spring or next winter. And that would be the, you know, the kind of the quickest schedule we could get on, depending on how, they, how the funding comes along. And you guys have walked in the forest, you've been up to the West Trib, I'm sure, and you, I just showed you a picture, a picture of, you know, a lot of these alluvial fan restoration projects. We have to remove a lot of trees, we have to regrade whole things, but because the Schultz Creek fan has not completely blown apart, we just have smaller channels through it, and we think that uh, we stand a really good chance of being able to use grade control throughout that fan and not and be able to leave most of the trees intact, be able to leave the recreational facilities, the trails and stuff intact uh, as we go through that process, because we know it's, while it's really important hydraulically that we preserve all those functions, there's a lot of other functions that it provides to the city and our residents as well. So anyway, um, so a little bit about what this looks like, what the practices look like, if you haven't seen them all. Um, you know, when we're working on the forest, uh, unless there's a road or a pipeline that we have to work around, we'll be using natural materials, usually materials that we've harvested from the site. We use logs for grade control, uh, we use large rocks for grade control, um, and we're rebuilding those channels. So you're building sills, buried sills, either out of logs or rocks to keep the alluvial fans in intact and hold their grade. And if you're working in, an, in a channel, you're building cross vein weirs, which down on the lower left side of this slide here, you can see some workers standing on some large rocks that have been put in to build a cross vein weir. And that helps shape the channel, but the rocks are immobile, and so the channel can't degrade or get any wider as it, as it goes on. Figure out how to do this. And also importantly, along with the alluvial fan and all this channel restoration, because we're working in the National Forest and because it has all of these other resources, we are doing a lot of revegetation because that helps with our hydraulics and uh, helps with sediment control. So we're planting grasses on the alluvial fans and, uh, and on the channel banks and anywhere else that we've stomped around and, and had to do that kind of work. But it does require heavy equipment. Um, it's hard to lift a four foot rock on your own. Um, and so, and that's kind of generally the size that will stay immobile in these conditions. So, whoops. And this is a little bit more of what that looks like. This is rebuilding uh, alluvial fans in the Thames watershed after, um, after the 2018 um, thousand year flood. So, all right, thanks. We are tremendously fortunate to have a local resource that has this kind of capacity. We're very, very lucky. <laughs> and the other engineering capacities that we have within this town are pretty amazing as well. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask uh, Jay Smith to come up. Jay is the Flood Control District's Forest Restoration Director. And as the chair pointed out earlier, um, this has been a top priority for the Flood Control District since 2017. Uh, they, the, the Board of Supervisors as well as the Board of Directors of the Flood Control District adopted uh, forest restoration as a primary and priority initiative at that time. And um, the reason for that is that we knew that our communities and the county and the district could not continue to sustain uh, what we're experiencing again now and that the only way to really have an influence on that was through forest restoration. 2018, Jay was hired and came on the team 
and began to implement projects, and he's going to talk about kind of where are we going now, what, why this, you know, what is this top priority, um, and the top priority is your watershed, which is the Rio de Flag watershed, that upper watershed, and I can tell you folks, if you think anything that you're seeing now is, is catastrophic or damaging, if this watershed burns, this area burns, you will have seen nothing. It will be unbelievably catastrophic. And so, and the, and the data and the studies show that. We're doing some more for fine studies to better understand that now, but it's gonna be devastating. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jay, and then, um, then we'll turn to the city, and I'll, we'll close it out. So thanks, Jay. Thank you. So when, uh, when the board of directors of flow control district decided to jump into forest restoration, I had a lot of people ask me, what does forest restoration have to do with flood control? I don't get that question much anymore. I think everybody kind of figured that one out, um, unfortunately. But the other thing is it's such a hot topic that with the chair and with Lucinda, they all say what I need to say. So before I even get up here, and, uh, but um, as, as Chair Horseman mentioned, you know, the, the district board of directors uh, elected to raise, increase the flood control secondary property tax, mainly for the reason of investing in forest restoration, knowing that we can't afford to keep doing the same thing over and over with the fire and in the post-fire flooding. We just, as a district, we can't afford to do it. Um, so with our investment in forest restoration, you've seen the 26 times more the flows we get about 26 times more the cost post-fire than if we would just invest in forest restoration and prevent those catastrophic wildfires. So, you know, if we can invest, say, $30 million, which is what we're trying to put aside for the next five years uh, to put toward uh, restoration mainly in the upper uh, Rio watershed, what we can prevent uh, for those post-fire flooding uh, We've done some small estimates, just real rough estimates, billions of dollars of infrastructure below in the city of Flagstaff, Fort Valley, through your neighborhoods uh, that we're going to be protecting. So that is our goal, to uh, work with the city of Flagstaff, work with the U.S. Forest Service, work with other entities like uh, National Forest Foundation, uh, partnerships that we have built over the last several years to try to really increase the pace of getting that restoration work done on the steep slopes of the mountain up to the, the uh, boundary of the uh, wilderness area and, and really trying to find how do we keep those fires from running up into that, that area to, to burn those steep slopes. Um, I will say also that the Forest Service will be announcing, they're working on and, and gonna be announcing this winter some updates in the way that they're going to do fire restrictions in this area of upper uh, that that watershed uh, right there above 180. So I think you'll all be pleased with that, the way they're going to, to be quicker at, at shutting those areas down, uh, at least to uh, vehicle traffic. So they're going to do some different modifications. Um, that's something that they, they talked to us about, and we strongly suggested, yes, let's we have to protect this until we can get full-scale restoration in there. We've got to do what we can do to protect this, this uh, mountain. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the city and let, let them uh, do their, their work that they're working on. Great. Thank you, Jay. And so as we move into the city, I just want to talk, and I should have done this up front, and I apologize I didn't, but... In terms of how this will work is the city will go through what's proposed relative to mitigation within the city. And then we'll take a few general questions, handful, couple, few. General questions, anything related to design, anything related to the actual infrastructure. There are sets of plans in the back and the engineers will be in the back, both for on and off for us and be able to answer questions. So we're gonna take a few, again, few questions then we'll move to the back. So, and really want to focus those questions probably more on some broader topics versus again, design and those kinds of things. It'll be much more productive to have those specific conversations with the engineers. So, and that's, you know, set up to get your input and hear your, your thoughts on the proposed 
proposed alternatives as they stand right now. So with that, turn it over to Ed. Thank you, Ed. All right, thank you, Lucinda. I'm gonna have to figure out where the slideshow is. Oh, right there. Okay, so uh, thank you. Great to see a lot of uh, familiar faces here. I'll try to keep this relatively quick so we can get to those questions, both the broad ones uh, we can take up here. And then um, as Lucinda mentioned, we have a lot of our engineers, both the county, city, as well as our consulting engineers that can take specific questions in the back, as well as uh, large print maps so you can actually kind of look over those designs a little closer instead of staring up at the, up at the screens. Um, so uh, if you don't know me, my name is Ed Schenk. I'm the Stormwater Manager here at the City of Flagstaff, and we'll walk through about 10 slides here, uh, me and some others from the city as well as from ADOT uh, to, to go over some of the in-city work. Uh, one that we've talked about a little bit uh, briefly, the mayor brought up uh, at the beginning, um, is that Schultz Creek uh, detention basin or series of detention basins. This is the design that was, uh, you know, put up pretty quickly right after the fire. And uh, as you can see, it's a series of three inline detention basins in Schultz Creek, if you haven't been out there yourself. Um, if you haven't been out there, this is what it looks like from the drone. Um, it is substantially complete as of this week. Uh, we are wrapping up the grant with NRCS um, on Wednesday. So very quickly, there will be some touch-ups after the Wednesday deadline with NRCS. Um, as mentioned, this provides us about 56 acre feet of sediment and flow detention. So it does provide quite a bit of benefit to the downstream community in terms of mitigating out that flood risk. Uh, that said, there still is a considerable flood risk uh, downstream, even with these large basins. And we'll be talking about that briefly when we get to the highway uh, 180 concepts. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce uh, Joe Loverich, for those who haven't met Joe before, uh, from J.E. Fuller. He's gonna talk through, just very briefly, uh, some of that mitigation impact in terms of flood modeling. Hey, everybody. Um, you all have seen, seen our maps before with, with the flood extents, uh, you know, going from the fire down through the city. So I'm, I wasn't planning on touching on that tonight. What I wanted to just do is to show you a quick um, shot of what these basins look like. What you're looking at here is a flood depth map. So it shows the, the potential depths that you're gonna see on any given spot across the landscape. And you know, this, this parcel is ideally placed um, for intercepting all of this water and being able to discharge it in a um, controlled way. So, so the way this process works is with the city, the city is working with um, Shepherd Wesnitzer to do the design, and then we work kind of back and forth with Shepherd Wesnitzer to do some modeling, say, okay, this is what I see your design is doing, is this intended, oh, yes or no, make a change, and get to a final design that both makes sense on the engineering end and provides the best benefit that we could see on the modeling end. So with these basins, basically for our two inch event, we had modeled about 937 CFS being able flowing into the basins. And with the basins in place, we have on the order of about 300 CFS flowing out in that same two inch event. So that's good, but these are with clean basins. So. As we all know, the water is not clean as it's approaching these basins. So this is an ideal scenario that can change throughout the monsoon season. When you start getting back-to-back -back storms, as we saw this last year, that effect can then be uh, muted a little bit as we, uh, as we go through it. But all in all, um, a very good reduction in the flows. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, as we get further along with the completion of these basins, we can update these models. At the moment, we're still going off of the design. So until we have as-builts, we won't have um, what I call final model results for the downstream. That's why we're showing this snippet here of just at the basins themselves. Um, 
So uh, Christopher Tressler did bring up the Mount Eldon Lookout Road and the improvement that the, the county is, is uh, hopefully uh, able to complete there. Immediately downstream of the road between Mount, Mount, Look, can't talk, Mount Eldon Lookout and Highway 180, obviously we have a very large stretch or a large stretch of channel that we've looked at and um, going back to kind of what Lucinda and Alan Hayden were talking about in terms of keeping that channel from unraveling, we have that same concern downstream of the detention basins because we will be metering out that water out of the basins back into the channel, which will have um, elevated flow after uh, coming out of the basins. So we have looked at uh, stabilizing the channel so that we don't have sediment being sourced locally and then going down into the Rio. And we had that uh, work or design completed by Natural Channel Design. Uh, we did submit that, the city submitted that to NRCS for EWP funding. Uh, as Lucinda mentioned, that pot of money is um, now um, essentially used up. Uh, so the county, the city is looking at uh, avenues to, uh, what's the best way to say that, Lucinda? Federal appropriations. So there, I'm, I'm, it's getting late in the day for even me. Uh, so we are looking for them to uh, put federal appropriations back into that pot of money so that NRCS EWP will be appropriately funded uh, for the work on the east side as well as for the work over here. Uh, this one's a little smaller than what the ask is on the east side, uh, about $900,000 worth of channel stabilization uh, between Mount Eldon Lookout Road and Highway 180. So at the moment, this has been submitted to uh, NRCS, the federal government, uh, but as they do not have money in the EWP at the moment, it is on the wait list, as are the EWP projects on the east side. So that is very important for us, both the county and the city, to get that federal appropriation moving forward. All right, moving on to Highway 180. Um, I will have Brendan if he has, if you want to come up and have, make some comments from the ADOT perspective and then we'll get into the city side. Uh, just a, a quick uh, shot here. This is a, a view of the Highway 180 area. Uh, you can see the different jurisdictions here. So essentially this is Highway 180 right here. Um, this is the existing 2010 FEMA map. So we have our floodway. Um, even in the FEMA map, we show that there is uh, an overflow at the culvert, and then we have this floodplain AO. Um, to my knowledge, this is the only floodplain AO that we have in, in the area. Um, what that means is that is sheet flooding, so it's, it's a broad uh, area of flooding. Um, this is based off the 2010 model, and then we have everything that's here that's in city on both sides, and then we have a county parcel here. So this is why it's a little bit complicated between the jurisdictions. Uh, and then, yeah, Brendan, if you don't mind uh, making a few comments from the ADOT side, we'll move on with the, the design. Okay. Thanks, Ed. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and appreciate everything that's in the, in the flood control district and the city's been doing. Uh, I just want to make a couple quick comments. You know, ADOT is... Certainly, and I am certainly aware of how critical an issue this is to folks here. Um, we do own 180 and the right-of-way uh, that encompasses that, and I just want everybody to know that, I mean, ADOT is committed to working very closely with our partners, with the Flood Control District, with the city, uh, in developing solutions. Uh, I know Ed's going to present a couple options that I think most folks have seen already. Um, moving forward with designing those options, vetting those options, and deciding what the best alternative is to move forward with is, is critical. But uh, for ADOT's part, we are committed, like I said, to uh, working closely with our partners, to funding improvements within the right-of-way. Legally, that's uh, what our mandate allows us to do. Uh, but we are here to participate and to make sure that we can uh, provide the mitigations needed. So that's all I have right now. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. Um, so moving on uh, to the design. So the current capacity is, is a little less than 100 CFS at that culvert, as many of you know. Um, those improvements are needed, as we know as well. We, we did contract out with Shepherd Westminster for those options or alternatives and have gotten it down to two alternatives out of many, many. Um, and these have been analyzed by the city, county, and ADOT and continue to be so. Uh, at the moment, these concepts allow for roughly 950 cubic feet per second, uh, which would contain the flow 
of a 100-year event. So that's a different event than that two-year and 45-minute event that we model for the peak flow. So this is looking more at a volumetric flow. Uh, the cost for either alternative at the moment, uh, our opinion of probable cost from the design engineer is approximately $5 million, uh, which at the moment we are still looking at funding um, for that. Um, I'm going to show this right here. It's going to be really hard to see, to be honest, um, if you're staring up at a screen. And we do have both of these alternatives in the back. So I do uh, recommend, if you want to look at this closer, um, after this presentation, we have both on the back table. So this is alternative one. It essentially starts at the existing culvert. The existing culvert is a series of eight by four concrete uh, boxes. Follows that existing pathway under Highway 180 and then it diverges from our current uh, structure. It continues down uh, to behind uh, the fire station number five, where it becomes an open uh, channel, open channel concept. You have a maintenance ramp here. Continues back through this private property, another culvert uh, under this private driveway, and then it exits into the Rio de Flag. The other alternative is to realign the channel uh, before it gets to Highway 180 to align it slightly to the north, and then provide a straight run, so a straight box culvert that goes from under Highway 180 all the way to the Rio de Flag, and then uh, continues down the Rio de Flag. A slightly simpler concept, but it does require a realignment of the channel slightly to the north. Uh, and with that, I am going to move on and provide Sam an opportunity to speak. All right, thank you, Ed. Um, Sam Beckett, City of Flagstaff Public Works. I'm not gonna hit on operations because for the most part, you all lived it. I don't wanna rehash that. Uh, but what we're doing is trying to wrap up and get prepared for winter. Uh, we used to call it snow season, now it's slow season in comparison to what we're dealing with in the flood area. But uh, with that said, our goal is to make sure we get the neighborhood as cleaned up as possible to help support you as much as we possibly can before we get into the winter season. We understand that uh, you know the sandbags can be some issues. By no means will we ever recommend that you remove them. However, we know several of you have removed them. With that said, we also know the production of these is very, very expensive. So our goal is to save as many as we can for the following years, reuse them if possible, if they're needed, uh, instead of throwing them away or seeing them go out to uh, be used as fill. So if that need does arrive, uh, call us at that 213-2102 as you see on there. We'll make sure we support you as best we can, but our goal is to get prepared for winter operations. And uh, just a shameless plug, you probably all probably saw, the uh, parking ordinance begins on the 1st, so always remember that piece. So plan accordingly and we'll support you in the process. I think from operations, that's about all I'll have tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Sarah Langley, Public Affairs Director for the City. Just wanted to wrap up with a few slides and wanted to take a moment to make sure everyone is aware of the Small Business Administration loans that are available uh, from the federal government. So if you were impacted by flooding during the dates on the screen this summer, uh, low interest federal loans are available. Those are um, available to homeowners, renters, and business owners. And the eligibility amounts are, are um, on the screen there. If your property or your residence is in the flood uh, risk map, you should have received this flyer on the screen with more information. Um, so what, just wanted to highlight that the deadline is November 18th, so that's coming up just a few weeks away. Um, if you are interested in applying, be sure to reach out to the Small Business Administration to um, get any more information that you may need. And then last slide here, I'm sure a lot of you do receive our email updates. If by chance you don't, uh, you can go to our website, flagstaff.az.gov slash pipeline west and sign up there. You can also sign up, we have some paper sheets at that back table there. Um, you can sign up there as well. And then any questions that for some reason aren't able to be answered tonight, you can email that email address on the screen. So with that, um, I believe we're ready to take just a handful of general questions. I'll turn it over to um, Lucinda and, and Scott. And we'll also be walking around with a microphone so that uh, the group can hear you as well. Thank you. 
Just one point I want to make uh, to build on what Sam shared is that uh, this coming next season, the district will not be able to invest in producing sandbags. It'll all have to be self-production. Uh, we spent so much money. Every dollar coming in now has to go to long-term mitigation, or we're just going to do this over and over again. So absolutely keep your bags. Cover them with plastic. Uh, prepare them to get through the next couple of seasons because we just don't have the resources to do that again. We, we have a significant stockpile that we shared with the city. We have a sig fairly good stockpile out on the east side. Um, so we can help with some replacement. Certainly some bags are going to get damaged uh, over, the, over the winter. But please do everything you can to maintain those sandbag walls because it, it's going to be critical that you have them again next year. All right, questions? Um, you said you were trying to clean up the streets. Um, I live on Mead Lane, and there's been a lot of construction work on Talkington. Um, so there's just been a lot of mud and dust, and the, the mud has never been removed. It dries up, and then it, the people go roaring down the street, and the dust goes everywhere. And it's, it's just been that way since July. So it would be nice if they cleaned up the, <laughs> the mud, which is sometimes blocks of dried mud and sometimes it's wet mud, but it would be nice if that got done. Um, the other, a couple of other things I wanted to know, wanted to mention was Mead Lane drains the entire neighborhood. Now maybe this is something I can ask at the back, but um, I talked to the people who were working on Talkington and they said the, 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 the pipes from Talkington, the middle of Talkington to the Rio are 14 inch from 180 to the middle of Talkington, they're 12 inch. The ones on my side of the street are 24 inch. So everything comes over to my side of the street and into my yard and garage. And that's, it's been that way for decades and it's, nothing has ever been done about it. Um, so I'd like to know if there's any, anything in the works to, to um, realign Mead so that the, it doesn't all meet in front of my house and to, um, to, to fix the drainage problem on the, north side of the street. Yeah, thanks again. It's good to see you out. I'm Scott Overton. I serve as the city's public works director. Um, also serve on our incident management team for this area in response this last summer. Um, again, as, as we mentioned at the last forum, uh, we want to make sure we look at those maps specific to me to talk about that culvert even a little bit further. So that's more specific to the debris um, coming from Talkington and the construction area. We've been working with standard construction and with uh, our capital improvements group to try to stay on top of that. Uh, it's clearly a, a, an issue that continues to be an issue. Uh, Mead is not part of that formal construction zone, but our streets group continues to run sweepers through there, but it sounds like we need to run through a few more times. So let us keep addressing that and keep going through, but um, certainly good feedback, and we know it takes a while to get all that dirt and debris picked up. Yeah, they haven't swept it out. They, they okay. run the water trucks through and spray it, so it, the dust is laid low for about 20 minutes. Okay. And, and then the trucks come through and then... Yeah, it's know, continuous. It that really construction is. works it difficult. Is, yeah. We get it. it. And also, do you have any idea what the... You said you were going to look into um, changing the forest closure times. I mean, I'd really like to know if they're going to close the forest, you know, before... L let me give that back to Jay. So this, this is something that the Forest Service just let me know about three days ago, so I have no details to go, but they are working on the plan. It's gonna be talking about modifying who can get into the forest at certain times during certain stage of closures. So they're gonna, that, they're gonna be doing a broad uh, campaign this winter to let you all know about that. That came from the district ranger, Matt McGrath. So that's something that the Forest Service will really need to uh, explain and, and they have jurisdiction over that. We just had input on that. Yes, we agree with they need to do more. Other general questions? Again, we're going to go to the back to do engineering. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Good evening. Thank you for convening this meeting. I'm Carol Curtis, uh, homeowner in Flagstaff. I'm formerly a proud member of uh, Coconino County Economic Development. Hi, Patrice and Lucinda. 
And I'm also joined here tonight by my family who own property that was spreaded out in Coconino Estates. Beautiful area there. Uh, my question is, and it's maybe a blast from the past, uh, is Ecological Restoration Institute still around and do they help out with any of these initiatives? Yes, they are still around and we are working with them, particularly in the forest restoration domain. Awesome. Um, absolutely. And they did conduct a study. They've, they've also worked with us on some of the economic studies as well, like looking at post Schultz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's been very helpful to demonstrate that it's far cheaper to get right. out and do the restoration right. versus <laughs> doing the response like we're doing now. Thank so, you. Good Thank to you see for you, that Carol. information. Good to see you. So um, I'm Catherine Kozak. I also look at, live on Cock Talkington in Coconut Estates, but I'm, I keep hearing you talk about that the federal government we're asking them for money and we're asking the city of Flagstaff, what about the state? Are they giving any money to Flagstaff in this? In terms of the state's contribution uh, to date, there, you know, there, there's kind of two different processes that go on. One process is kind of the, I'll say the standard disaster process, which the State Department of Emergency Management, it's called DEMA, is actually in effect federal emergency management, FEMA's representative here in Arizona. And so when a state level declaration of which there were three this summer are declared, then we, then we the city and the, and the district become eligible to submit for potential reimbursement for some costs, not all the costs, some costs. And then we potentially can get up to 75% reimbursement. Typically that takes years. For, and, and then a lot of times they're not, they don't recognize any kind of proactive effort. So, so for example, in museum, when the district spent in 2019 $1.5 million to mitigate the museum corridor, because we were going into museum, you know, into monsoon and we had two, we, you know, we spent two weeks, you know, almost 24 hours a day working to mobilize all that mitigation effort. We, did, we haven't gotten a single dollar back. So, you know, we did, we did then were able to submit for 2021 museum cost in response and mitigation, um, short-term mitigation, sandbags, barrier, that type of thing. Some of that, those costs they'll pick up, but they don't pick up all costs. There, there are other funds that we have attempted to access, very limited. Um, I will say that the state did provide uh, for Sandbag production, the physical production of the bags at both the uh, um, Winslow and Kingman prisons, the labor for those. We provide all the supplies. We had to purchase all the sand, sandbags, transporting those sandbag, the material to the prisons, transporting the sandbags from the prisons to here. Um, so that still ended up being a pretty significant cost, but it, we did get the labor covered, so that was a benefit. Um, that's it. I don't, unless the city got other resources. I, I was going to say, I think we've actually both benefited as well from um, the DFFM funding, the Department the, yeah, of Fire yeah, and Forest true. Management. Yeah, that's been, um, that's that's been a lot of uh, one-time monies, uh, some equipment costs, but that's been a new source out of the governor's office that has been pretty beneficial to the city in the last year or so, and uh, we'll continue to look at that resource um, as it goes towards matching or towards equipment costs for maintenance um, in post-wildfire flood events. And, and to that end, that was a, a one-time bill that was passed by the state legislature after the telegraph and set of fires in Gila County um, last year. Um, that, that was passed, and then I guess it was last year or year before. Joe, what, was, what year was that? Last year, right? Um, so that bill, so that, there's a bucket sitting there um, that's going to exhaust, right? But we are applying and, and we have received, as Scott mentioned, a fair amount of reimbursement for some of the work. But they, again, they only cover, for example, they only cover debris removal. They don't cover barrier. They don't cover sandbags. So, so there's a lot of process involved with the different reimbursements, you know, um, and so forth. So another question? Yeah, John Nauman, I live on Whiting in Cook United States, so we had the Rio de Whiting two or three times. 
Um, I was just wondering why there isn't a representative from the Forest Service here, um, and is there going to be an, a process for input into how they set up restrictions on the Forest Service uh, on Forest Service land? Um, because, like, I'm just for an example, Williams has yeah. restrictions on the north side of Bill Williams Mountain that allows hiking and biking, but you can't camp because it's a watershed and it's a huge flood risk for Williams too, so. Yeah, absolutely, and we've spent how much total, Jay, on Bill Williams Mountain? 6.8 million to date. You know, restoring that because that was identified as a really key threat to the regional economy, um, as is the threat to the upper Rio. Um, certainly, I really encourage people to reach out to the Forest Service and request them to, you know, I think Jay's correct that they'll, they're going to do a public communication process to discuss what they're going to change relative to these policies and practices, so. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to piggyback on that, too. I'm a resident, current resident of Mead Lane, um, and I was flooded, not as much as Gail was, but we've been impacted all summer from it. I used to live in... Co um, Timberline, Saddle Avenue, and I experienced and was affected by the Schultz fire and flooding as well. I moved into town and escaped that, and here I am again. Um, <clears throat> so we've known, I've, I lived out there since 1991 in the um, Timberline area, and we knew Schultz Pass is a wind tunnel. And I always had very good fire insurance because everyone out there knew that if a fire was ever started in that area, it would come right through to Timberline. I feel so badly for my old neighbors back there. Um, so now it's, we've had four fires in 12 years in this Schultz Pass area wind tunnel. This is unacceptable. I would re really like to see the city uh, really kind of knuckle down on the Forest Service and say, this is, you know, we're closing the barn door here after the cows have escaped. And we really need you guys to put the pressure on. It's not up to me or Gail. I mean, we're part of it, but we need the city voices, the government, to stick up for this. And um, I, I don't blame all everything on the Forest Service, but they made some mistakes, and we all, oh, I've been here long enough to see a lot of Forest Service mistakes. And we need you guys to con come down on these people because I don't know what the problem is there, but I'm sick of experiencing fires and floods. And, and my property values went down out there, my property values are going down here, and all, all those pe poor people behind Safeway and, and Sunnyside, oh my gosh. Um, so please, you guys be a louder voice for all of us. Well, I can say on behalf, do you, Chair, do you wanna come up and respond to that? But I yeah, can say on can. behalf of the county and district that we've been very strong and, and, and advocating. <laughs> Yeah, we could both respond on this. This has been something that, especially this summer, I mean, we even called a special meeting when they decided to lift fire restrictions before 4th of July weekend and as a city council to put additional public level pressure. But we are on their, on their backs constantly. And one of the big things, though, that restricts us is that we have the county, Coconino County National Forest. They have to respond to what happens in D.C., so when even the Coconino County National Forest that, Coconino, yeah, Coconino. Coconino. Uh, <laughs> the Coconino National Forest, even when we have uh, representatives from the Forest Service there who are also saying, yes, this needs to be done, it's inevitably a decision made in DC. And when that happened, I made calls to all nine representatives in the state of Arizona to put pressure on the DC office to try to keep us protected. Uh, we are seeing it that with the situation though, we are starting to gain a little bit of traction. I'm hoping moves forward. Uh, we were speaking with Matt McGrath uh, the, uh, of the Coconino National Forest, not the Coconino County National Forest, um, to really take a look at their metrics because one of the big things is it does not include the human factor whatsoever. It is humidity, it's things that we also know now are thresholds that should not be the same as they were in the 1990s. But I am very glad to hear in the last couple weeks they are taking a hard look at this at the national level, not just even the local level. 
and that um, both the chair and my, Madam Chair and myself have been saying this absolutely needs to be a public process. You have to hear from our people too because you need to really understand what's going on on the ground. Um, so we're trying to put pressure from grassroots up. We're trying to put pressure from the federal delegation. We're trying to put pressure at the city level, the county level, everything we can do. And it's just a beast to try to move along. But I'll, I'll let, yeah. Mayor, you did a great job. But the, the other thing is this, that we can and we will carry on what you are saying. Please continue, however, to be a force uh, with the Forest Service and letting them know how you feel. And I know many of you are, and I want you to know many of us sent our letters uh, personally, and, uh, and uh, Tom O'Halloran, Representative O'Halloran, sent a letter based on our requests uh, to, again, close that forest uh, this summer. So we're continuing to work with uh, the, uh, um, su uh, the su uh, supervisors for both the Coconino and the Kaibab, we will carry your message forward. We're hearing you, we agree with you, and we also think there should be uh, a meeting, a community meeting with the Forest Service, and they can explain this. So we will carry that message forward as well. Uh, we need to hear from them, and they need to hear from us. So thank you. All right, one more question, and then we're going to move to the back, and people can ask their questions. We're all going to be here milling around, and so we'll do one more question. I'm curious to know if there is a realistic timeline for the two very excellent proposed uh, paths across the highway back to the Rio, and how long are we going to be um, planning to keep our sandbags in place? And where is the single point failure that could derail the process? Is it property access? Uh, is it federal funding? Or is it uh, some other aspect of uh, the usual bureaucratic process that, that uh, has to take place before things get done? Thank you, sir. I think the best answer is going to be Ed Shank from our stormwater group um, with some of those details. Hey, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know that we have an answer for you in terms of the timeline yet. We're still working uh, between, uh, you know, ADOT, the county, and ourselves. Uh, it's not just a funding question. It's also a question of putting in the design for it. Um, if, we, if there is a Build America clause on it, that's going to require us to, you know, get a Build America, you know, the steel and the concrete and et cetera. Uh, through that process. Um, so I wish I had an answer for you in terms of a realistic timeline. Um, we are moving it as quickly as we can. It is obviously a very high priority for all of us. In terms of sandbags, it's something that we are going to assess uh, through the winter. Uh, again, we are just putting in this detention basin right now. Um, it is going to probably come down to a personal risk preference on whether you want to keep your sandbags there or not, uh, depending on where you are in the community. Um, We'll come to you at some point with some point this this season um, with new modeling results, but we're not there yet. I and mean, we literally do not have the as built for the detention basins. It would not be appropriate for us to put out a model without those as built. So, folks, we're going to cut it off. If you want to talk, if you have other questions, more general questions, we, you can talk to us. But I'll tell you, in terms of the district, we get the money. We're going to mobilize as quickly as we can. Um, in terms of that on-forest work, we will mobilize. As, as Alan noted, though, there are two different areas that play up there. One area is under greater restrictions than the other. It's got to go through a more lengthy NEPA process. We'll work through that, but there will be a, you know, even if we get the money in December, there'll be a bifurcated process for that work, just given the, the, the situation up there with, with the the owls and some other requirements that go on for that forest work. So, so th again, thank you very much for coming tonight. Please grab us or uh, grab one of the engineers in the back, and uh, we'll do our best to answer questions. Thank you.